Graham, is the reason some wealthy people oppose democracy deeper than we think? Uh, those of you who are longtime listeners of this program uh, will recognize some of this. I've talked about this before, but I think it's important, you know, at least once every other year or so to, to bring it up and, and, and do, a, do a history lesson, basically. I mean, the, the history of the human race since the agricultural revolution, you know, seven to 10,000 years ago, has been not one of democracy. It's been, by and large, at least the history of what we call Western civilization and as well as Asian and, I mean, all the way down to the Incas and the Mayans, it's, all, it's almost always been a history of emperors and popes and kings and queens and, and you know, the, the rule, rule by the rich. And, you know, then we started this dem democratic experiment 240 some odd years ago. And... It seemed to be going well. It seems to be getting better over time. But now we've got a movement being run by extraordinarily wealthy people, uh, what I refer to as the morbidly rich, trying to basically reduce democracy in the United States. Uh, I, you know, we had, we had a guest on yesterday from uh, documented.net who was telling us about this new article that they, that they just co-published with The Guardian over on The Guardian's website. In fact, the, the first paragraph, uh, the advocacy arm of the Heritage Foundation, the powerful conservative think tank based in Washington, spent more than $5 million on lobbying in 2021 as it worked to block federal voting rights legislation and advance an ambitious plan to spread its far-right agenda calling for aggressive voter suppression measures in battleground states. So why would... Why would the morbidly rich and their personal, you know, foundations and the corporations that made them rich, why would they be throwing money into efforts to reduce democracy in the United States? There's actually a fascinating backstory here. It goes back to 1951. In 1951, Russell Kirk, who was a, you know, kind of a well-known conservative uh, gadfly thinker, published a book called The Conservative Mind. It's still in print. It's, in fact, it went through uh, three or four different editions before Kirk finally died. And, uh, you know, updates uh, over time. And in that book, and, and probably more importantly and more explicitly in many of the writings about and around that book, particularly by people like William F. Buckley, uh, who argued in print in National Review that, you know, whites should continue to control the United States because blacks are inferior, it literally said that. Um, but around that book and that time in the early 50s was this theory among Republicans, among conservatives, that the growing middle class at that point in time was a danger to American democracy. The American middle class in 1951 was growing faster than any middle class had ever grown in the history of the world. By that point, 1951, about half of us were in the middle class. That had never happened before in any country. And Kirk and others around him, uh, particularly Buckley, predicted that if the middle class continued to grow, we would hit a point where the average working person would have enough wealth that they would have the leisure time to engage in politics which had traditionally been the support of the rich. And that once the average American started getting politically active, it would produce chaos. We would be, there would be riots in the streets, the country would be on fire, the, the proletariat would rise up and demand that the, 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 the rich be taxed to death and all that money be redistributed and that would be the end of society, the end of democracy, the end of America. Now when Kirk published that in 1951, there was only a small number of conservatives who took him seriously. They thought he was a crackpot. I mean, Barry Goldwater loved it. William F. Buckley loved it. But Dwight Eisenhower in 1954 said of Kirk, not specifically, but of the billionaires who were funding him, actually, the Hunt brothers, he said, or, or supporting him, he said, you know, the, their numbers are small and they are stupid. That was in 54. But then came the 1960s. In 1961, the birth control pill was legalized. By 1964, it was in widespread use, kicking off the women's movement. Women were saying, hey, we can control fertility now. We want equality in the workplace, equal pay, equal rights. We had the civil rights movement was getting very, very active in the, throughout the 1960s. 
And you know, with the, the crescendo uh, being the assassination of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, and of course the passing pass, uh, in, in what, 67 I think it was, and the passage, or 68, and the passage of the uh, Voting Rights Act and Civil Rights Acts in 64 and 65. Uh, I've got the order backwards, but you know what I'm talking about. And so by the end of the 60s, in addition to those things, there were a number of high-profile police killings of unarmed black people that then provoked riots, and so you had cities on fire. So you had women burning their bras, or at least that, you know, that was the media narrative. You had black people burning cities. You had the war in Vietnam by 1967. You had students burning draft cards. I mean, this was, the, at that point, you know, the conservatives, oh, and the labor union, the labor movement was in full, you know, full swing uh, 1970 was the peak, 5,716 strikes in that one year, over 3 million workers walked out in 1970. And as that ha happened, these, these four things happened, these four movements all happened in the 60s. Conservatives looked back at what Russell Kirk had written and said, my God, this guy was a prophet. The country is in flames. The, the, the young people are rebelling. The women and minorities no longer know their place, for God's sake. We've got to do something. And what they did was in 1980, they elected Ronald Reagan. And the, the, the Reagan agenda was, you know, very straightforward. Declare war on labor unions so we can dial back the wealth and thus political power of the middle class, the working class. End free college across the nation so students would study in fear rather than be willing to protest. Increase the penalties that Nixon had put on the war on drugs so that uh, the, the, the force of law could be used against black people and the anti-war hippies. As John Ehrlichman you know, pointed out, I've shared that quote with you many times. So I won't do it again, but you can easily find it. Well, it's in my piece today at HartmanReport.com. And, uh, you know, Reagan cut taxes on rich people. He cut the, he dropped the top tax rate from 74% down to 20, 27% ultimately. He put a tax on social security income. He put a tax on unemployment benefits. He, he uh, created a mechanism to tax tips. He ended the deductibility of uh, credit card, car loan, and student debt interest, all things that were used by the middle class. He declared war on labor unions. He crushed PATCO. He brought a long, young lawyer named John Roberts into the White House to work out ways to overturn Roe v. Wade. His vice president brought in his son, George W., to build bridges between the GOP and the fanatics in the, in the, the, the hard right part of the evangelical Christian, Christianity movement. And he and Bush pushed through the, uh, the, the, the or, or re revived the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade and wrote NAFTA, which Clinton then signed. And sure enough, it worked. Reagan's doubling down on the war on drugs shattered black communities. Our prison population exploded. It became the largest in the world, both in, as a percentage of the population and in absolute numbers. His war on labor cut average inflation adjusted minimum and median wages. I mean, his war on students, now we got $1.7 trillion in student debt. And the key to selling all this to Americans was Reagan's assertion that democracy is dangerous. He said this in his, in his first inaugural address on January 20th, 1981. Ronald Reagan got up and said that government is not the solution to your problems. Government itself is the problem. Democracy is the problem. Because they believed that that instability in the 60s was the result of too much democracy. Now, my argument is that that instability in the 60s were the birth pains, and I think the analogy to, to labor and childbirth is an is almost perfect one. They were the birth pains of a, a, a whole you know, societal transformation. Civil rights, voting rights, uh, women's rights, you know, right across the board. But that's not how the Republicans viewed it, and so they basically went to war against us. And I, I am hopeful that by laying this out, that the reason why these plutocrats, these, these morbidly rich people are funding efforts to dial back democracy, to suppress the vote, to make it harder for people to have access to, to, the, to the vote, to make it harder for people to participate in politics, 
to pour money into the system so that you know the 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 actual desires of average people are largely ignored that the reason they're doing this is because they believe this is what's necessary to create a stable society Edmund Burke the uh, British philosopher back in the 1790s Thomas Paine stopped at his house in 1793 on his way to the uh, French Revolution to get himself arrested. Uh, that wasn't his plan to get arrested, but that's what happened. Uh, James Monroe bailed him out, in fact. Um, but uh, when Payne stopped by, Burke, you know, made this statement that, uh, you know, being a hairdresser or a candle maker is just fine, but people like that shouldn't be allowed to vote. It does violence to society, was Burke's comment. And Payne was so pissed off by that, he wrote an entire book rebutting Edmund Burke. His book is still in print. It's called The Rights of Man. But that, that was the dynamic. Burke's worldview is the same as the modern conservative billionaire worldview, which is that society must have order and classes, and stability is more important than progress. And, you know, I disagree, frankly. I think that progress is more important than stability, and instability is actually a sign of positive forward motion. It's a good thing. And I think it's unfortunate that most Americans don't realize that it's not just, you know, rich people aren't buying the political system and making it harder for average people to vote, particularly black people, young people, older people, you know, students. They're not doing that just because they want to have more tax cuts and they want their companies deregulated. I mean, that's a piece of it. That's a benefit. But for many of them, for the ideologues in the conservative movement, their main goal is to create a stable America. They look at the era of popes and kings and queens and emperors and whatnot and say, that's stability. After all, Europe, I mean, you know, the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages lasted more than a thousand years with almost no change. Stability. That's what they want to take us back to. What say you? I'll pick up your calls in a little bit.